is your microbiome also implicated in autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or even type 1 diabetes? Oh, sure. So um, there's data that's come out that shows that if you have what we call a leaky gut, which is when those layers of defense are gone and the toxins can come through, that that can trigger inflammation and that can go to your joints or that can go to your pancreas. Yep, got it. Um, there's actually a, a, a lot of research now that's starting to show the connection between the food you eat, the health of your microbiome, and your risk for developing a number of, like you said, chronic diseases as well as autoimmune diseases. And you know, as this research comes out and as more and more information it becomes available to researchers, it's really becoming fascinating to see just the wide spectrum of, of uh, illnesses that can literally be caused by damage to your gut lining. And, you know, it's really important for people to understand that, like, you know, once you protect your gut lining by changing the foods that you eat, then, you know, that can be a gateway to making sure that your total body health is maximized. Absolutely. I mean, a good example is celiac disease, right? Which is a reaction where you have a, um, an allergy to gluten, right? And so these are not, most people don't have an allergy to gluten, but, you know, 7% of the population, I'm sorry, 2 to 3% of the population has uh, celiac disease. And so when celiac patients eat wheat, then what happens is it goes into their gut and it gets rid of those layers of defense. And then you get that leaky gut and the toxins come into your bloodstream and you get inflammation. But it's not that celiac disease is just an illness that affects the gut. It's an illness that goes all over the body. So it's just a case in point that if you, what you eat can then go and affect your gut, which then can cause systemic inflammation. So you can see then that one, just, just one illness, but you could see how other people could develop rheumatoid. Somebody could get type one diabetes. Somebody could get cardiac illness. I mean, there's so many different physiology or pathways that inflammation can trigger illness. Okay, so can you talk to us a little bit about your experience helping people with pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes improve their metabolic health? So what have you experienced and what metabolic improvements have you observed? Oh, it's awesome. So, I mean, getting rid of diabetes is just one of the things that happens when you change your diet. So in terms of dietary changes, often moving people towards eating more plants, uh, eating more fiber-rich foods, um, and getting out of getting out of eating complex carbs instead of refined carbs. When we do those changes, then we people are amazed at their alterations. So they eat loads of fruits and vegetables, for instance. They're blown away by the change in their gut. They're like, oh my god, I'm having so many bowel movements. But yes, because there's so much more fiber in their body, and um, and so everything the, and getting rid of the refined foods that's all helping their gut flora and their gut biome. And so if you improve those, um, those things, people come in and not only are they losing weight, but they're cutting out the sugars in their diet. There's not a lot of added sugars. And so eating more fiber brings down their cholesterol, eating less added sugar and refined foods and eating complex foods will allow their insulin level not to activate as quickly and it's slower over time. I don't need to tell you guys that though. And so over time, um, the insulin level is activated, but more slowly than with refined foods. And so um, people see that they're, they're, um, that they're not only losing weight, but their sugars are coming down, um, their weight is coming down, and their cholesterol is coming down. It's, it's awesome to see the changes that people are making in our clinic. Yeah, this is fantastic. I, I love to see that, you know, not, you're a cardiologist, um, but yet you're still affecting profound change with the population um, with people with diabetes. So, yeah, most of my patients, remember, you know, 30 to 40 percent, if not more of my patients have uh, some form of diabetes, either pre-diabetes or diabetes. And remember that one in uh, three people by 2050 will be pre-diabetic or diabetic. Yeah, that's a scary statistic. No question about it. Okay, so, so this next question may not necessarily be that fair, but um, because you specialize in the management of you know, heart disease in particular, but also see a lot of people with diabetes, um, if you could give us a sort of like top three recommendations, top three lifestyle modifications that someone could institute in order to prevent the development of cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes, what would they be? So, yeah, I mean, it's a hard question because in – because there's so many things that I would want to say in that and sort of narrowing it down to three is a little bit challenging, but let's give this a go. So I think the first thing that I usually tell people to do um, 
Well, I actually make people a pyramid and I make people, everybody knows about the food pyramid. And so I make people a pyramid and I have the bottom part of the pyramid and I call that the optimal zone. And then I have the top of the pyramid like that. And I call that the no-go zone. And then in the middle, there's some things in the middle. So if you primarily eat in the optimal zone, then you're going to do great. And so I try to tell people if they do nothing else to their diet, but they just add in fruits and vegetables, then they're going to make an impact on their diet. It's mostly vegetables than fruit. So I usually tell them to eat, you know, the WHO and the CDC and the AHA all recommend about five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And remember, a serving is not three strawberries. A serving is a cup of, um, of uncooked vegetables, a half a cup of cooked vegetables, or a baseball-sized fruit. So if we want to eat, we want to have people eat five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables. And there's even data to say up to 10 servings per day. A lot of people say, oh my gosh, I'm diabetic. I can't eat that fruit. But then we'll go ahead and eat cookies and crackers and, you know, white bread. And so people, you know, to understand that those are also sources of sugar. And if you remove sort of those refined sugars and add in the sugars that come from fruits and veggies and where you're getting all these other nutrients, it's okay. And people are always surprised by that, by when they remove the refined foods, their sugars are going down despite adding in fruits and vegetables. So uh, one of the first things I would say is add in five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables per day. The second thing I'd probably say um, would be to take something out of the, uh, actually, the, yeah, the second thing I'd say is I'd probably remove, uh, go into my no-go area, which is I would remove red meat and dairy. Like if you can't remove all animal products, I would at least remove red meat and dairy to start. There's no benefit ever of eating the amount of saturated fat in red meat. Uh, and I also feel the same way about dairy in terms of the amount of saturated fat uh, and sugar that you get in dairy, plus the IGF-1 and the inflammation and the inflammatory marker triggers from dairy. So those are the two things I guess I would say to remove at least. Um, and if I get a number three, I would say, or maybe I've already used up my number, but I'll steal one anyway and say that um, number three, I would say is try to add in whole grains and uh, legumes um, and lentils, those kind of things. Um, whole grains, legumes, lentils um, into your diet. So as you're removing out that red meat, uh, you could add in sort of those foods. Great. You nailed it, actually. You know, actually, I, I wanted to pin you down and, and only choose a three, even though I'm sure you could talk about the subject for hours, simply because at the beginning of the lifestyle change process, many people feel overwhelmed. And they say, okay, great. I understand there's, you know, 55 changes I, I you know, should make over the course of time, but that's too much to think about. So what we're trying to do is help people who are at the beginning of this process understand that they don't have to tackle everything right here and right now. And just like you mentioned, you know, there's three that you would focus on, eating more fruits and vegetables, removing meat and dairy from your diet, and then also eating, adding legumes. And just those simple changes right there can take care of 80% of the whole, you know, the whole equation right there. So that's super helpful. Yeah. I often tell people that, and sometimes this helps, is that our goal is not to make you vegetarian or vegan, whatever that means. The goal is to get you to move towards that side, which means lots of fruits and vegetables, whole foods. And so if we can even just start changing your palate slowly and slowly and we get you to one side, then slowly they themselves, you know, that's, that's the first step. And once you start changing your palate, you don't want those sugars anymore. And then sort of the next steps that come um, are e much easier to, to handle. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good point, which is that at the beginning of this process, I think a lot of people, some of the feedback that we've gotten from a lot of our clients is that, they find, you know, eating more fruits and vegetables and eating less dairy and eating less meat, it just doesn't taste good. You know, it just doesn't taste good because there's sort of adaptations that have happened on their taste buds and their brain is not necessarily right. sensing the pleasure as it might have right. before they were eating. Right. I hear that a lot too. Uh -huh. Yeah. So do you notice that over the course of time that people who start eating a more plant focused diet, um, maybe they don't like it at first, but they start to like it over the course of time and then it becomes... Oh, yeah. I'm Absolutely. I mean, just think about, I will tell people that at the beginning, the foods that I'm going to offer you, provide you or recommend you eat are not going to be your favorite choices. But I will say just like the same way I'm Indian and I grew up Indian, eating Indian food and I love Indian food. You haven't maybe had Indian food. Well, you have Cyrus, but other people may not have had Indian food and they may find that um, that Indian food's not very tasty. But similarly, I didn't grow up eating Thai food. And so when I first had Thai food, the first time I hated it. But 
it took a few tries of eating Thai food and now I love Thai food or sweet potatoes. Uh, I used to hate sweet potatoes, actually abhorred them. And now I love sweet potatoes. So everything's about changing your palate and it takes time. And I think we, you just have to remember to allow yourself the time to change and to accept what your body has to give. And then just slowly sort of remember that the goal is to get closer to the other side, which is more fruits and vegetables, eliminating red meat, eliminating your dairy and getting in those legumes, lentils, beans, um, and if we can get there, and a lot of people describe they hate the texture of beans. And so I always tell people like, okay, I understand that, you know, they don't like the texture, you know, that's again, that's a palate thing. That's not, and so that, that is, so I tell people, okay, make a bowl of beans, have a few bites, and then put it away. And then try it again the next day. And slowly and slowly, they'll try a few more bites. And then by the end, people say that about hummus, for instance, I don't like hummus. And so, but I do the same thing with people on hummus and they'll say, you know what, six weeks later, I really like hummus. Um, So it doesn't take that long to change your palate.